I think I've accepted the fact that most people definitely don't want to come here. It's a job you've got to love to do or you would get burned out and you'd be out of it very quickly. And do they look at me as Jim Bush, their neighbor and their friend, or do they look at me and remember that that's the guy who buried my wife? Well, today you're in our Remembrance Center, which we developed in the year 2000, and it was really a comprehensive approach to make sure that every family, regardless of their economic means or choices or types of personalization they wanted, understood that they had one place, one shop, you know, shopping convenience that they could go to get anything relative to death or bereavement. My love was radio. Come spring break my senior year, I still had not landed a job uh, in the area field of, of broadcasting. And Dad said, well, why don't you come home and try the family business for a couple months? Well, here I am 26 years later, uh, now the fourth generation uh, owner with my brother Jim. We have a saturation of funeral homes in the marketplace. And uh, we have been the market leader and have been blessed to be the market leader really since we began to open our doors in the late 60s. In 1986, we merged with the Bush Funeral Homes here in Cleveland. Jim is the youngest son of the Bush family, and he's one of the owners of this company now. And um, through our merger, my daughter and Jim met, and they got married, and they have three children. The oldest one will graduate from Avon Lake High School in 2009. Dad will admit it, and I think Jim will admit it, and I know I'll admit it. You know, we missed our childhood with our dad because of the demands of this profession. And if you didn't get up in the morning when Dad got up to go to work, or you didn't get up and uh, stay up until he came home, uh, you didn't get to see much of my dad. Uh, the past 15 years have been a blessing uh, that my dad's decided to take a different path and turned over the reins of the business to Jim and I. And uh, we now have a wonderful father-son relationship amongst the three of us. To be frank with you, I'm glad my sons are now running the business because it's changed so much. And it's not changing slowly, but it's changing rapidly. When I was doing it, practically every service was a, a full service where it was, you know, usually two days of calling hours. Now, now it's uh, either immediate cremation with no services or just a, a short calling hours uh, before, before services. The likelihood of a family business going from its first generation of ownership to its second generation of ownership drops considerably, and the likelihood of it going from its second generation of ownership to third generation of ownership, the percentages that successfully transfer even goes down further, and the likelihood of any family business potentially ever being transferred to the fourth generation of ownership. It, it's it's a very small percentage that ever accomplished that. I am related to the Bush family through marriage. I am actually, I'm a Burmeister. Um, I married Bill, uh, Bill Jr., uh, and uh, that's WCB's son. Uh, WCB is the father of Becky Bush, and Becky Bush is the wife of Jim Bush. So um, almost in any f uh, funeral home family, you will find that, that uh, it's generational, that the business is is passed along from generation to generation. You'll often find brothers owning funeral homes together, um, cousins only owning funeral homes together. Uh, we, we live above a funeral home. My in-laws live above a funeral home. Uh, both Jim and Mark Bush have lived above funeral homes. I have actually lived in a funeral home for 65 years, and still do, in an apartment over our funeral home in Avon. My grandfather um, it was a funeral director and his uncle was a funeral director. My brother's a funeral director, so it's a family. Family tradition, I guess you would say. Uh, you'll find, I think, especially with my sons, that there's a strong faith, there's a strong faith base to this particular facility. I have a, a strong uh, religious faith that I believe that there is a better place that we go and that uh, we'll, we'll reach that reward you know together it's a lot easier when we're working with a family that's a religious family and has been churched uh, and are deep deep in their faith 
they accept the death a lot more than a person that does has no faith. And uh, so as I look at it, I, I am more concerned about those that are atheists that have no belief system that there is a better place that we move on to. They really don't have a sense of purpose. They are sometimes appear to be empty. They're just not sure how, how to cope and they just don't have that, that firm belief that, you know, that there is a heaven, uh, that there is a, you know, triune God and the different things. So, um, you help them, uh, you know, cope with their loss and a lot of the ways that we do that is by having them view the deceased and actually have some realization. But in their situation, they're not just saying, uh, you know, they truly are saying goodbye. They don't think there will be a great reunion someday. I have a strong faith, and I, I know someday uh, I'm going to see Jesus. That's the way I feel. And uh, um, we look forward to that day. And uh, I, I've never been afraid of death. Uh, I've been close to it many times with my wife. I mean, I just, she just had a stroke uh, a week ago Sunday. You know, and you never know where that's going to go. She's had a number of times when she's been close to it. But there's always been the faith, and I think working with that, and I think part, part of it is working with prayer and the like. I think I'm giving you a little different aspect than what you're really looking for. We call this uh, area our care center. Most uh, funeral homes refer to this room as a prep room. It's where the preparation of the body takes place, the embalming, all embalming takes place in this room. And embalming is the chemical transfer of blood for uh, a formaldehyde or a glutaraldehyde-based solution into the body for preservation. Um, I really enjoy embalming. I find a, I get a great deal of gratification out of seeing someone come in looking not so good and leaving looking healthy and kind of like they were asleep, although that's not a generalization that we like to make much in the industry. That's, uh, that's what I like about it. One of the things that we need to uh, always consider when you're looking at a body is the fluid that you're going to use, um, and it depends on, on how the body looks when, uh, when it comes into the care center. Um, one of the things that you want to take into consideration is whether or not the body has edema. So we've got fluid for edema. We've also got um, fluid for jaundice, we've got fluid for the um, viscera or internal organs, and um, there's, just, there's just many different, many different uh, uh, solutions that you can use. Uh, this one, for instance, has uh, lanolin in it, so if somebody's uh, you know, a little desiccated or dried up, you notice that especially around the eyes, you would use this in your mix. Now they were planning on just using stock footage in here, so I really would ask you to be respectful with how this part of it is, is done. Ever since I've learned to embalm back when I was in college in Cincinnati, and certainly since then, I still feel that is the reason why people want to have a funeral. They want to see their loved one and what we can do in order to prepare their deceased loved one to be able to be presented to them, to be viewed by them in a much better condition, in a much better state, a much better appearance than perhaps they last saw them is extremely fulfilling, very rewarding. Uh, it's a very technical process and at times it can be very uh, you know, off-putting based on some of the things you see and the odors that are present, but ultimately the finished product, uh, a family that is extremely pleased with the appearance of their loved one. I mean, it makes it all worthwhile. My father died in 1968. I prepared his body myself because um, I had basically learned from him and I thought I'd, I'd like to do this the way he'd want it done. It's not that I don't feel bad or don't grieve. Many, many things I get involved with, I get, I get emotional, you know. I um, have trouble with it, so it's not that you become immune to it, but you, you certainly understand that it's part of life and it's going to happen. Being desensitized to death, I believe, comes with this territory, honestly. Um, people come to us looking for the support and the guidance and the stability that they need, whether it's emotional or just the direction that they need. Um, they're looking for us for the guidance. So in a way, we have to be sort of detached, sort of desensitized in order to be able to give them the advice 
and point them in the right direction and make the offerings and the suggestions that they're looking for? It's not always easy to do this, um, but it's well worth doing, and it's well worth doing well, and that's why I'm here. Because I think Bush, I mean, I really do think, and yes, they pay my paycheck, but I think we're the best. And so we created the Remembrance Centers here. Uh, we have them located in Avon Lake, Fairview Park, Elyria, and Parma, uh, where people can freely move about the room and control their service design experience. From flowers, to printed materials, to remembrance mementos, to caskets, to urns, to vaults, to caterings, and basically what it allows them to do is come here, clearly see a written explanation, detailed pricing of the particular product or service. People want to feel comfortable about their current funeral purchasing experience. They, they want to look around first. So it's all more of a cluster type situation where you can actually service, service all the locations from one, one facility where the corporate the large corporate, they try and do this, but they do it on a regional basis, and they can't do the servicing that we can. And still you have the independent uh, ability to uh, handle it with, with the individual families. I have heard of the criticism of, you know, that Bush is big or Bush is impersonal. Jealousy? I don't know. Um, I know we're not going to bury every person that dies here in Northeastern Ohio. I've accepted that fact. Uh, but it is a highly competitive environment in many respects. Well, I've selected a profession that is generally recession-proof, and everybody will need my services at some day, and I will likely remain employed for the majority of my working years. Today, we do everything from airport coordination, hotel coordination, uh, ground transportation, catering services. Uh, we're actually event planners and what we're doing is we're capturing the stories of a lifetime through very highly personalized events that have DVD tributes, uh, that have webcast broadcasts of funerals uh, so people can view uh, the funeral over the internet live, um, the use of photography and photos. Research has indicated that our advertising, marketing, public relations and top of mind awareness of the name Bush is, is very important to, to what we do. Um, just as any uh, successful uh, company uh, continues to promote uh, their excellence and that's, that's what we're about is, 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 our, is our, our excellence and caring uh, for people uh, on the most difficult days of their lives. And not just during those days. You know, we do it before, during, and after the funeral. I guess that's where we clearly differentiate ourselves is that we just have brought a level of a, of a continuum of care to the marketplace that a sole proprietor can't match. It's just not, it's just not possible. Cremation is obviously on the rise. When I started in the family business, about uh, it was less than one out of every ten families selected cremation. Today it's five out of every ten families select cremation. So. You can see it's been a big, big change. I don't think I look that old, but um, it's, it's happened pretty fast over the last 20 years is that we've seen that jump from less than one family out of 10 to five out of 10. Uh, we offer every family that uh, uses us for cremation a time to come in and view the cremation of their loved one, which means that in this room, the, their loved one would be laid out right before the cremation. They could come in here um, say one last goodbye. This is our cremating machine. In the business it's known as a retort. Um, we use it every day. We use it more and more. Cremation is on the rise, almost 45% uh, in this business. Um, I believe that uh, Mr. Smith is in there right now. So, um, and uh, when, he is, when he has been done uh, cremating and cools down, we will uh, put him in his urn and I will take him back to the, home, the funeral home where I live with me so that he can be given back to his family uh, by the funeral director out there. Now this is our processor. Once the cremated remains have been taken out of the retort, they are placed over here. We go through them with a large magnet to remove any um, 
metal pieces that would have come either from the casket or from the deceased, like staples from the casket or um, rivets, other things from, uh, from blue jeans or pants, also underwires from bras, things like that. Then the cremated remains go into the machine. They are ground into a fine um, dust, which people call ashes, but it's actually um, pulverized bone. Um, and, then, um, it, and then it's placed into the urn that is chosen by the family. So that's one thing that people don't realize is that when the body goes into the retort, it's so hot in there, the flesh, the fat, everything is burned up, everything but the bone. And then the bone is so dehydrated that it's very easy to break apart. So um, that's what this machine does. It's like a, a grinder for the, for the uh, dehydrated bone. I definitely prefer to be cremated. Um, whenever my time comes, my wife certainly knows that um, my preference is to be cremated as opposed to buried. Um, whatever, whatever takes place prior to the cremation, I'm okay with, but I just like the thought of personally being cremated. So, <laughs> I got more specific in things that I did want in my casket. I don't want any diamonds or any jewelry. Um, I want my macaroni necklaces that my kids have made for me. At my funeral, I don't want anybody to speak. I want to sing songs. <laughs> it's what is is what uh, I'm, I'm, I like music, and uh, I think I, there's certain songs I want that I want certain points to come across through those Christian songs. Uh, do I get time off? I I would say that my most successful time off is actually when I plan to be away from the community and really get outside of it because you don't get your time off by staying here because there's always questions about what you do. My most successful time off is where I go somewhere and nobody knows that I'm a funeral director. That two-year-old that attended the funeral today when he's 11 and wants to know something more about his great-grandmother, you've got more than just maybe a photo album to show him. You've got a DVD tribute. You've got a CD of the funeral itself. Uh, and that could be passed along. Uh, every funeral <clears throat> could have its own book written about it. Every life deserves a book to be written. And that's what we're trying to do at Bush Funeral and Crematory Services is help families to the extent that they want to uh, capture that memory of a lifetime. <laughs>